So this was a brief hurried summary session of the first eight chapters because we had nine chapters because we had finished it in the previous camp. And now we'll go a little more uh, slowly and systematically. We are with chapter 10, Conscious Force. So as we can see, Sat or pure existence, conscious force is chit tapas and then the next chapters will be delight of existence. So it goes in a sequence after explaining to us the human aspiration, the aspects it has taken, our surface vision and how it does not go with what we are here to discover. Shobindo reveals to us, but what is, what is the way that the Vedantic seers took? And what did they discover? So they discovered that there is a pure existence, that there is a stable basis of all this movement that we perceive in this creation. But then what we actually experience is not a stable basis. What we experience is matter which is force in motion. We use the word stable. But actually, if we go deep within, there is nothing stable in that sense. Everything is constantly changing. Everything, even the physical body, constantly, atoms, cells, molecules, everything is changing. The, the stable, the water, everything is constantly in motion. So what we perceive when we look at this world of phenomenal reality is that everything is in motion perpetually. The Jagatyam Jagat of the Isha Upanishad. Jagata, that is constantly moving, changing. So then the question arises, what is this movement? Okay, there is a pure existence which the Vedantin has discovered. And we can take it that yes, intuitionally also, there has to be some stable basis behind all this creation, this dance which is going on. But what is this dance? Meaning thereby, is it simply the play of material energy whirling in space? Something which is obscure, which is just set into motion, God knows how. Or perhaps he doesn't know because if it is Maya. <laughs> but it is in motion which is creating results and the results are forms. Or is this energy in motion, intelligent, conscious? So all these questions, Sri takes up in this chapter, Conscious Force, but he starts with from near to the far. What is near to us is matter, physical things. So he says that when we look at physical things, we see that it itself is constituted of energy in motion, force in motion. Not one force, but different kinds of forces as it seems. And the physicists tell us about these forces. We know as the positive, negative, electromagnetic, weak uh, electrical and strong, weak electromagnetic and strong electromagnetic, the gravitational force. And all these forces combine to create what we know as matter. What did the ancient physicists say? They said the same thing, but they used different names. They used the word space. Akash Tattva, Tattva, principles and forces that are in existence. Vayu, Agni, Jala and Prithvi. Now you see why it is so important for the intellect to be thoroughly uh, purified of this hurrying to jump at conclusion. I will give just one example. And no offence meant to anybody. In Vastu, that nowadays Vastu has come a big way. So, they say that this place is meant for Agni. So, kitchen should be here. Or not meant for Agni, therefore kitchen should not be here. What has Agni got to do with kitchen? Agni is everywhere. The Vedic Agni is the earth for progress. I just recently I know of somebody who said, according to Vastu, they said, no, no, everything is wrong with the home. The place where the child is studying, actually that is the place of Agni. It is the kitchen place. I said, no, that is a perfect place. Agni is about progress. Ag, that which leads us. 
But when we don't understand it like this and we understand them only as outer, just like planets as outer, we have lost the deeper truth. The rishis who gave these truths were not simply looking at the fire which we burn with a you know, matchstick and said Agni. Of course it represents symbolically that Agni. But that Agni is that energy in matter itself it is there. How is It has three ohms. In matter it is found as Jad Agni. In the atom as the Jad Agni. In the mind, in the mid world it is found as Vidvat Agni. The lightnings of the mind. And in its own home, the supramental truth, that's where you find it in full effulgence. Now imagine if we were to say, no, no, in matter you can light it like this in the mind, try to do some lighting a fire. But we use this word even in our colloquial language. He is, there is a fire of progress in him. I want that fire. Don't people say, fire is missing? Are they meaning something physical or even subtle? What does it indicate? It is not about kitchen. It's about the thrust for progress. So in matter there is this divine energy. It emerges as Shail Bala, the daughter of the mountains, climbs further as Brahmacharini, Chandra Ghanta, so on and so forth. And this Agni takes us to the its own home, Siddhi Dhatri. Such a beautiful thing. The whole Kundalini science can be understood as Agni. So these five elements are subtle energies which have woven the warp of woof of existence. How did they come into existence? Did he create five? Okay, I'll create some Agni, some <laughs> Akashiya, Tattva. It's Tattva. It is ether, ether which can, it's the most plastic form of matter if you want to put it. Even nowadays scientists speak of five states of matter, possibly seven. So it is that original matter. It has that capacity, ether, etheric tattva. So there is, it cannot be five things. Origin has to be one. So when the divine, let's put it like that. I love to use the word divine. We can use the word Brahman or that. Let's <laughs> divine. He starts the manifestation. We'll take up the question why he started at all. That also Shavinda takes up. So what will he start with? He, he no material. Where will he go and get matter? Give me some matter. I want to start the world. So this analogy that you know he builds like a potter out of the clay. Where is the clay? He has to become the clay also. He has no choice. So he first out of his own being, he brings out this etheric which is nothing but just the subtlest of vibration which can expand indefinitely. That is the ether which was accepted by scientists. Then it actually went into discredit. But you like it or not, internet will take us to that point. Ether. It's that primal state of matter where, and become very, very powerful. Nad Brahman. You can take it like that. Why it is so powerful? Because it is the original condition. You can't go beyond it. That's why we see that story of Shiva and Jalandhar and they, you know, they go to, uh, he is born out of Shiva. And he through Nad wants to defeat Shiva. But there is a point beyond which he cannot go. Because Shiva is not just the five elements. He is beyond even that etheric condition. So the absolute. So we have so many stories indicating it. But we have got these stories now, turned them into a superstition whole thing. So matter is built of these five elements. The first of these is the etheric state or space or Akashya Tattva. So here Shivabindra takes up the Sankhya philosophy. It has its great sense and Sankhya literally numer numbers, Sankhya. That's how. So it describes the constituent elements in nature. So it says there are five basic elements. How? By modifying one, the other comes into existence. Meaning thereby, out of this primal condition, matter which has emerged from that one being. Sankhya doesn't speak about emerging from the one being. So Sri will take us to that point later. But out of this primal condition of matter, that cannot form stable forms because it's just extending, extending. It can extend into space. It can even move and there would be a sense of time, but it cannot build forms which are stable. 
Step, forms has to be created when there is an obstruction to the flow. It's like if the ocean is flowing static. But when there are waves which collide with each other, for a moment we'll see some form. So this obstruction is the space modifies itself and out of ether or akash emerges vayu tattva. You see, in our colloquy, uh, in our folklore, what is this vayu tattva? Vayu tattva is now that which by modification there is a flow which begins to obstruct each other. And if we actually see, even materially, as we come down, we see the flow of current, we see all these storms, how they are, you know, currents flowing in different directions. So this is the vayu tattva. And vayu tattva, again there will be beings who are carrying this vayu tattva in plenty. I feel like going into this topic endlessly, but I have to resist, I know. So we have Hanuman, who is Pavanaputra. So leaving aside the story, he has in him this abundance of vayu putra, vayu tattva. So what is that? What does vayu tattva do? It expands, Matrishwan. So Hanuman has that capacity. And because of this Vayu Tattva, he can go very high in terms of his consciousness. But where he cannot reach? Into that ether which is the domain of Indra and beyond the Surya. He cannot reach there. So he has to come back. That's how the story goes. That the story is very picturesque. Indra puts a bolt and says, no, 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 you are transgressing. He is transgressing because Vayu Tattva is not supposed to go into that. Creation would dissolve. So that way he is transgressing. So there is the Vayu Tattva. And now we understand when we have in Ayurveda, Vayu Tattva. We have these even three types. Vayu Pradhan. And then there is Agni Pradhan, Pitta, Jal Pradhan, Kaf. Vat, Pitta, Kaf. And in Chinese medicine you have. And you have the other, other two Tattva also. But imagine now, Vayu Tattva means, oh, you have a lot of gas, what kind of things it is? <laughs> it has nothing to do with gas. <laughs> Maybe gas in the mind, because of which some people imagine all kind of things. <laughs> yes, it expands. So wherever Vayu Tattva goes, it expands. Your mind will start imagining all kinds of things. That's the nature of Vayu Tattva, you can't help it. But it creates imbalances. So when we understand that way, we see a new understanding of these elemental states. So there are... If, if the state of Vayu is more, there will be this natural tendency. But all earthly forms will have all of these in it. So Vayu Tattva is that which modifies. Also, we have this another thing in our common parlance. Hava lag gai hai. Have you ever heard this? It's not superstition. It means some vital being, vital force has attacked you. Hava lag gai hai. And then Hava ko Hava se hathate hai. fuk karke. But if it's taken into the body, it's very difficult. Abhi hawa lagi nahi hai, that vayu has made home. So th these are very interesting things which came from a deep knowledge, but they are now become superstition. So vayu tattva. But this cannot also form stable forms. It can give you like storms. For a moment you will feel, ah, hurricane, vayu tattva, interacting with each other, hurricane which will take everything fly. It makes everything fly. That's its nature. Hurricanes in our own life, storms in our life, they have a tendency to completely uproot us from where we are and take us far. If we have faith, it will take us nearer to God. If we don't have faith, we drown into the... St it is the nature of Vayu Tattva. When it becomes Prabal, it changes our life also. It can uproot completely. So Vayu Tattva. Then it modifies further because stable forms are not yet there. So then there is a principle of fire, Agni. Why? When Vayu keeps wrestling with each other, clashing with each other, what is created? Vidvat Agni. Agni. So what does this Agni do? For a moment it coalesces. For a moment. Briefly it brings such, because it is electrically charged now. So it has a tendency to attract certain things and therefore it tries to create a form. But again, not very stable forms. Agni Tattva, when you have seen, you look at the fire, when it builds, brings out forms, or when there are electrical currents flashing, you'll see a momentary form. So the same way, the mind, it can build certain forms, but they are not lasting forms, they are not stable forms. 
So then, next level, where we see some semblance of stable forms, Jala Tattva. What is this Jala Tattva? Jala Tattva is attraction and repulsion. So, these Vayu forces or aerial forces, now, they are not randomly colliding, they are attracted. When they are attracted, they form a bond. And when they repel, they allow others to form other bonds. So you have some semblance of, so what is its tendency to flow together? So that's how it becomes Jala Tattva. And we can understand, see how water vapor becomes water and then condenses into ice. And what is involved in this three process? It's heat. So Agni Tattva, that's why Agni is the first which builds the forms, at least it starts some process. That's why it's called a Jatavedas. It knows all the forms. So, with the application of Agni, we can turn ice into water. Further you increase the Agni, it changes into vapor. Dim the Agni, it becomes less and less. That's why even today, we Aag nahi hai kya? Aag chali gai. Death ke baad bhi bolte na, thandi ho gai. Please don't say like that. <laughs> he will say, what is this? But thandi ho gai. <laughs> so, because, well, the fire has gone away. But Vayu is still active. The Pran Vayu doesn't immediately go. So, so much of occult knowledge we can discover just by understanding these five elements which are states of matter. But in ultimately, the Jal Tattu, there has to be something more which can create this collision, uh, cohesion, something cohesive. So, in Jal Tattu, we see attraction and repulsion. Now, it must become more strong, bonded, cohesive, physical. So, Jal Tattu is like Attraction and repulsion. But attraction and repulsion we know today attracted, tomorrow repelled, third day again attracted. Somewhere else. So this is so, that's how it is going all the time. But what is the way if you want to create cohesion? Physical. Some physical bond. Get married, have a child, live in the family. I am not saying this is a good thing to do or bad thing to do. I am just saying look at the process. So anything which is rooted in physical becomes very strong. That's why it is so difficult to get rid of family-based attachments. They are rooted in the physical. People are very fortunate who can be free from that. Yes, fortunate because it, at one level it binds you, holds you back. And yet it's so strong. Why? It is because rooted in the physical. People who are brought up together in, in a particular physical environment, they get bonded. Physical things, surface consciousness, eating habits, language, all these things. But beyond it is the vital, which is the domain of these uh, Pran Tattva, which is aerial and Jala Tattva. In between you have rooted in the Agni, in aspiration. Something very deep and solid. And then there is the Akashya Tattva. So this is what Sri now describes. So why these things are required? Why matter is required? Matter is required because the Supreme who is hiding all these possibilities within himself, he wants to see himself. Imagine, what must be his problem? Everything is in him. He wants to know. He knows in some essential way. So as an artist, the only way, and it is one of the very good therapeutic ways, is to write. Write a diary, write a letter to mother. So you'll see many things emerge, and you'll see it with such clarity. Or speak to somebody. Dangerous if you speak to just anybody. <laughs> so, because why? Because you objectivize. So the Supreme wanted to objectivize. Manifest himself. Therefore, he wants the manifestation to be solid. But there are levels of manifestation from the Akash Tattva where there is just the first stir. Then to the gods of the vital worlds, beings of the vital world, then the gods of the mental worlds and the psychic world and then the physical where gods have forgotten they are gods they are at the mercy of all the gods so this is where the solid but yet this is where he wants to intends to do his ultimate work that's why he created through all these series and why all this will come to that so this manifestation when he wants to objectivize himself this universe is his own object objectivization and that objectivization is a force in motion. 
and it starts from the first stir and that force modifies itself modifies itself modifies itself modifies itself presents to us a stable matter but this is also not enough you have to also have something to perceive so the divine or that one creates also the five senses to perceive each aspect so you have space etheric vibration so you must have the faculty of sound and then you have aerial element you have touch that's why you see this aerial element healing touch you must have heard that song chue koi mujhe par nazar na aaye kahin dur jab din dhal jaye look at the beauty of the song it is touching a very subtle truth chue koi mujhe par nazar na aaye vital awakening of vital love chue koi mujhe par nazar na aaye or even the divine sense there is a touch corresponding to aerial element fire sight what does the fire do it is light and heat so we can see things and we can do many other things it's will so fire is that element that gives sight then jala of course we all know jalebi and kachori and samosa jala tattva the taste and we have prithvi smell don't we say even now pehli barish ki sugandh a smell which comes from the earth water is there but when it touches earth that smell is something very very uh, different unique so earth smell now what are these senses at each level these senses also undergo modification there is a divine sense where he hears without ears and he sees without eyes that's how it is described because that sense is such it is an unerring sense you can't cheat him you can't deceive him you can't wear very white clothes and say see i am your great bhakta i have been going to temple every day he will say yes yes i see <laughs> that's all he will say so there is a divine sense by which the divine perceives the total reality of this creation these senses also get diminished and diminished and diminished and we have now the human senses which hide much more than they reveal so this is the truth behind these and there is other thing that how does consciousness come we'll touch upon that we'll first read about just this sense arrangement because this is a very fundamental truth how matter is formed page 87 conscious force all phenomenal existence resolves itself into force into a movement of energy that assumes more or less material more or less gross or subtle forms for self presentation through its own experience how beautiful this is he wants to see himself in whom in everyone see shubhendra writes who is god one of his short poem and after describing everything he says in the worm for sees the coming god when he looks at a worm he says oh one day i will out of him evolve the godhead that is hidden in him we we look at a god and say oh he is just like us <laughs> each to the limits of his own vision but that is the difference the elementary state of material force is in the view of the in old indian physicist now he is using this word a condition of pure material extension in space of which the peculiar property is vibration typified to us by the phenomena of sound see this is just a primal vibration of course we use the word om oh, it can never correspond to that because uh, human faculty fails and yet this has the power to manifest that divine reality see how scientifically indian said gone why because it is a primal condition mother describes an experience in paris she says when first time someone chanted om she saw the divine reality 
Same thing when the Agni Mantra were being read. So it has still the power. And the mother says, because in India particularly, it has been associated so much that this sound has that magic. So it can manifest. Why? Because it is. And of course, there is something beyond this sound. That's my own invention. That is Ma. Okay? So beyond all sounds. But this is the primal vibration. Sound. But vibration, and that's how speech also modifies. Speech has sound and words. Sound is a more powerful word without the true sound accompanying it. It falls flat. Read Savitri. It was the hour before the gods awake. Read it. It was the hour before the gods awake. It changes. Sound is the primal thing. Even in everyday life, we must be very careful. Sound is so important. And this sound, human voice can actually take this sound to its utmost level. Mother says human voice has this capacity. But vibration in this state of ether is not sufficient to create forms. There must first be some obstruction in the flow of the force ocean. Some contraction and expansion some interplay of vibrations, some impinging of force upon force, so as to create a beginning of fixed relations and mutual effects. We see this in the echo effect. So if we conceive that this material extension as sound is going, where is it going? Extending into space and something comes and then there is this play, the aerial element is born, Vayu Tattva. Material force modifying its first ethereal status assumes a second called in the old language the aerial of which the special property is contact between force and force contact that is the basis of all material relations. See how much we have developed? Now we are having contact by aerial medium even etheric medium not just physical contact. So there is this, even at the material level, you'll see these signs coming up. Like Shobindu said, tele, a telegraph is a sign that science has progressed towards something higher. Because now we are using subtle elements. And even in their physical world, they are representing, however imperfectly, that truth. In an imperfect way. Still we have not as yet real forms, but only varying force. So after speaking on phone, it is not enough. You must meet. Don't decide everything on phone. Because it is still the aerial element. So when you meet at the physical, this is produced by a third self-modification of the primitive force of which the principle of light, electricity and heat is for us the characteristic manifestation. And that is the Agni Tat, the fire. Even then, we can have forms of force preserving their own character and peculiar action but not stable forms of matter. Agni can create That's the first forms which are beginning to emerge. A fourth state characterized by diffusion and a first medium of permanent attractions and repulsions termed picturesquely water or the liquid state. See. We use this language, ये तो मछली की तरह है। ये पानी की तरह रंग बदल लेता है। ये इसको जो डाल दो उसी में वो घुल जाता है। We use these expressions, no? Why? It is based on attraction, repulsion. So people often use the word "go with the flow." This can be so dangerous. Go with the flow may mean प्राण का झोंका. Or go with the flow may mean by attraction and repulsion. So, but this is how it is. I am going by the flow. Sometime I ask which flow. Are you sure this is the Ganges which is taking you to the Maha Ocean? But these things have come. There, because these men will explore these things. But we should know it in all totality. Once we understand that it is the power of attraction and repulsion, there is a tendency for things to flow towards those to whom we are attracted. And there is a law of attraction, there is a different thing. People have written books and made movies on it, that's uh, their business. But there is something else which attracts, there is a principle of jala. 
and then finally and a fifth of cohesion termed earth or the solid state complete the necessary elements it's not enough to be attracted something has to bind together something which will root you right to physical so that is the principle of earth and as i said it applies to everything in diseases diagnosis those who you know practice ayurveda now hardly anybody practices this way so if you have khasi they think that you know cough element cough and cough is nothing to do in common but cough element the water element and it points towards an inner disharmony if you really observe the water element that means probably this problem of attraction and repulsion is very strong in nature and therefore the person is prone maybe to sinus blockage and all this is a whole science this is not a class of ayurveda so nor am i an expert but these are the hints and glimpses pith too much of agni it is coming out in various ways all kinds of agni and agni will burn one way or the other so the only way is you can channelize agni treatment for pith related disorders channelize your energy towards progress probably you will get well but the doctor may get less rich so but it is very profound science ayurveda now of course it's all forms of matter of which we are aware all physical things even to the most subtle are built up by the combination of these five elements upon them also depends all our sensible experience it would also mean which element is prabal in nature so you will see that particular sense you must catch with all the senses creation but it's very difficult so what are these the sense reception of vibration comes the sense of sound by contact of things in a world of vibrations of force the sense of touch by the action of light in the forms hatched outlined sustained by the force of light and fire and heat the sense of sight and see it is hatching everywhere it is applied sight baby is in the womb before that heat and then there is the inner baby is in the womb or in a egg and there is the heat which is nurturing the baby and then when the child comes out first time you are seeing the sight see everything it forms a very beautiful correspondence and equally if we increase the fire element the urge for progress it may impact our senses sight if we have this opening to the inspiration revelation truth hearing it will impact our hearing sense many other things it's a whole world to be explored okay by the fourth element the sense of taste too much of water too much of attractions and repulsions or whatever by the fifth the sense of smell if we are very grounded rooted well in earth sense of smell so these are present and nothing is like higher or lower they are all operating together and the divine himself uses all of them and we also should have a perfect harmony of these senses but the problem is and we'll state the problem and take up the solution later contact of sense with a force how does it lead to awareness consciousness that's where we enter into the big conundrum as it is called force is coming impacting my ear drums going into my brain touching the brain how do i become aware it is sound not only sound somebody is sound whom i like to hear about so how does this conscious experience take place simply by the impact of forces and senses this is the problem of consciousness how did it's not that sankhya didn't deal with this problem modern physics is grappling with this problem it has explained the five elements of matter it has explains the senses but why consciousness so the sankhya thinkers philosophers they said well all this is the property of nature along with these uh, five gyanendriya karmendriya 
and the five uh, you know uh, through which we have this perception the special indriya they brought in two more principle mahat and ahankar so this you know this force is a cosmic force mahat vast it's operating all over it's not just within you so it's active everywhere and then there is ahankar which is the dividing principle therefore the cosmic force is acting but because it is acting through the ahankar i get this idea i am hearing this one sound this particular sound that's how they explain still the problem remains <laughs> so they went one step further they said well you know what consciousness is not a property of nature at all it is the proper property of purusha purusha is conscious there is in him that light and when that light falls on prakriti prakriti becomes conscious it's like if i throw the light in some dark room people who are there first they may say don't don't throw the light it disturbing then they may wake up and they may see things which were there but they were not aware and from this bhed between purusha and prakriti purusha who sets everything into motion consciousness and purusha who can withdraw from prakriti it becomes jada inert started the patriarchal model in society trust me it comes from that purusha is after all the purusha so tantra said okay i'll explain it another way it says no 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 is the other way round it is force alone that exists force builds the forms and force creates the purusha in her own being <laughs> so the devi is ultimate then they were reconciling truths force and consciousness they are basically one but in what way when force withdraws completely it is nothing but consciousness pure awareness when it starts creating builds the world systems of worlds then it is prakriti so purusha and prakriti are basically one but prakriti when it ceases it becomes purusha realizes itself as purusha or herself there is no gender out there though but it's just to understand but when it when the purusha or that begins to send forth its energy to build the worlds it becomes prakriti so from that comes another problem shivinda <laughs> takes up so do they alternate or is it continuous is it like today the purusha says i will write a nice poem so now purusha has become prakriti so much so is completely lost in it so much so that in is busy writing a poem and the child comes and says dad uh, you know what mom has been shouting at you and you can't even listen and the poet in him is all lost in then the call of prakriti brings him down yes what happened and the purusha is involved in another prakriti and then he says time to go to bed rest so prakriti rest in purusha this is one way to explain alternating so when you are writing a poem you have become the poem you have forgotten who you are so the purusha forgets himself in action this is also we experience but alternately the prakriti can withdraw itself into purusha and then you are who you are so meaning thereby never disturb a person who is busy and ask for a favor chances are that you will be refused because he is lost in that movement of prakriti if it's a very good movement maybe wait let him be quiet find out sahab kab shanti se baithte hain and then you go that's why the advantage of pa pa knows when to really approach this is the right time prakriti is resting <laughs> he is all purusha so all these are various ways it has been explained but the problem still remains they went to that point that they say nahi both are going together on shiva's breast is the dance of kali together why because if purusha has to go forth as prakriti still the base is required for the dance 
So at once he becomes the basis and at once he becomes the dance. Still, all this explains everything except how did consciousness emerge at all? Where did it come from? Okay, in Purusha, but where did it come from in the Purusha? The only way to explain it is, if we say, in that pure existent already consciousness is inherent. So what we see here as Purusha and Prakriti is Sat Chit Tapas. And together, they are all the time together. There are two who are one and play in many worlds, in knowledge and ignorance. They have spoken and met. Our pleasure and pain, our thoughts and life, are they title deeds? Our pleasure and pain, are their eyes interchange? So that's the game, existence and consciousness. Let's put it like that, Ishwara and Shakti. Or closer to our heart, the mother and Shurabindo. They are one together. That's how the play. Why the play? That though uh, it will be the next chapter, but a little bit. For Ananda. Why? Because now Sat and Chit have come together. They are always together. What is the other trinity? Ananda. And when we look at life like that and live like that, then everything is Ananda. But that's a problem. Let's not skip the chapter. So, existence and consciousness are one, inherent. And Shubhindra takes us logically through these steps. Why? Because he shows us, we'll read that part tomorrow, but he shows us that normally we mean by consciousness, mental consciousness. So, we have a tendency to believe everything else is unconscious. But if we look at plants, we see there also there is a consciousness. That's why in uh, when Shobindo in Arya days used to write news of the month. So one of the news was J.C. Bose discovery that plants feel. They respond. Plants talk to each other. And what do they talk? If you cut a, a trim a bush and you are harsh, plants communicate to each other. There is a harsh fellow all around you. Actually, it has been recently discovered even scientifically, they have a way of, of course, they don't speak Sanskrit or Hindi. They have their own way, plant language, shh, like that, whisper. And plants understand. So what do they do? They begin to, you know, uh, start behaving in a queer way. That's why we have all this, shamko, don't cut the flower and things like that. Of course, some of them go to mother directly, like our big banyan tree. Mother, they have thought of cutting me. What? She calls them. You want to cut the tree? Mother, who told you? We had only we were thinking about it. So the trees are conscious. Plants are conscious. It takes us still deeper. What about matter? No, actually there is things known as metal fatigue. Metals have their own life. They go and they, they de 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 degenerate. We have also the half-life of things. So they also have a life cycle. There is something which is called as they get stressed out in their own way. Even electrons make a choice. So when we look deep, we'll say, yes, there is a kind of consciousness even in metals, even in atoms. That's why this world is, you know, we read in physics that uh, outer orbit of an atom must have two or eight electrons. Fine, we know it. Why? Because we have read a book. But who taught it to the atom? So there is... This knowledge and will inherent in matter. So Shivindu takes this logic still further. Why not even below matter, which we have not yet known, and why not even beyond mind? There are ranges of consciousness. So he says if you see this entire world from the sub atomic to the atomic to the plant world, living worlds, mental worlds, world of the gods and beyond, we will see this entire existence is woven in the warp and woof of one consciousness. Everything basically, there is consciousness inherent in everything, now manifested in a certain way, held back, half manifested, all this. And it has momentous conclusions. If there is consciousness in matter, then prana pratishtha makes perfect sense. It is not a murti, not even a vikra. There is a technique and way 
by which we can awaken and which consciousness see all shanti mantra start like that purnamidam purnamadam purnat purnamudachyate that totality of the divine is held within every block of matter and if you do it with consciousness with that bhav of a bhakta that's how it is done when you make a vigra what do you say you pray oh lord we are going to give a material shape to you who is beyond form and name and it is going to inflict some pain and they pray and then they do the chipping and then they pray that we are going to ask you to be here please stay amongst us and then there is the manifestation in a block of stone or wood the divine can manifest this is the secret because consciousness in everything and you will have a response so long as it is established and later on of course things may change because if there is nobody who invokes so that way the divine consciousness is everywhere so it is one consciousness which is in everything and this is the secret india knew which it lost and this is the secret the world lost and is trying to recover when it says mother earth is living dharti ma we grew up in that and now we are once again rediscovering this secret when we say everything is conscious not just living plant is conscious handle things consciously we'll see mother handling every material object consciously and she goes on to say if you handle them carelessly it means that it is a sign of inconscience why because consciousness is here nityo nityanam chetanas chetanana eko bahu naam yo vidadati kaman tam atmastham yenu pashyanti dhira stesham shantim shashvati netari sham thank you we'll meet tomorrow continue the journey